Next, the Bush administration and regime change in Iran. Former U.N. weapons inspector Scott Ritter talks with Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter Seymour Hersh about the Iranian threat and the possibility of war. His new book is Target Iran. This is an hour and a half. Good evening, and welcome to the New York Society for Ethical Culture. My name is Michael Bogdanfi Cree, and I am president of the Board of Trustees of the Society. While all of you know something about tonight's distinguished guests, I expect that ethical culture is a mystery to at least some of you. The New York Society for Ethical Culture was founded over 125 years ago and has been progressive, liberal, and proud of it from the beginning. Among our outstanding achievements are the founding of the Visiting Nurse Service and the Ethical Culture Fieldston Schools. We joined with others to establish the NAACP, the ACLU, the Legal Aid Society, and the New York Committee to Abolish Capital Punishment. Our members have a long tradition of advocacy on civil liberties and human rights issues. We are humanists. We place our faith in a demonstrated capacity of people to do wonderful things. We believe in the worth and dignity of all living beings and seek to respect and protect it. Our conviction is that we must conduct ourselves and the business of our institutions in such a way that we bring out the best in and for all. As a community, we believe that all people have the right to life, freedom, and dignity. We stand for the separation of church and state. We stand for a woman's right to choose. And we stand against the death penalty. Among the commitments that we ethical culturists make to ourselves and the world is to learn continuously and live courageously. There is no question that tonight's guests, Seymour Hirsch and Scott Ritter, embody both these commitments. That is why we proudly co-sponsor tonight's event through the donation of our auditorium. I'd like to give special thanks to the Nation Institute, Democrats.com, and Public Concern Foundation for making this exceptional program possible. Membership at Ethical Culture is open to all who share our values. I invite you to get to know us better. Please stop by our table in the lobby where you can pick up literature and sign up to receive um, notification of future events. You can also check us out on, w, on the web at nysec.org. That's nysec.org. And now Ham Fish will come out and get you going on, your, on tonight's program. Thanks, Michael. Uh, good evening, and on behalf of the Nation Institute, co-publishers of Nation Books and Scott Ritter's new book, Target Iran, welcome. A few housekeeping items. You'll find copies of the Nation magazine in your, uh, on your seats containing two cards. Please fill out the one asking for your contact information so that we can be in touch with you regarding future events. And the other card is for questions you may wish to pose to tonight's panelists, and ushers will be coming around later to collect them. There will be a book signing following tonight's event, and books by both authors will be for sale at the table to the left of the stage later on. I'd like to welcome our live audience and our viewers around the country to tonight's conversation and I'd like to add to Michael's uh, thank yous also our co-sponsors Democrats.com. You are to be, given, uh, to be forgiven if your primary response to this evening's program is a sense of deja vu. We convened a conversation with tonight's participants a year ago in this very room to sort through the wreckage of the Bush foreign policy and the catastrophe in Iraq. Tonight, we turn to the deepening crisis of that foreign policy and the looming possibility of further catastrophe in Iran. To assist us, we've enlisted Scott Ritter, who, as is widely known by now, is the Chief Weapons Inspector for the United Nations Special Commission in Iraq and is the author as well of another title from Nation Books, Nation, uh, Iraq Confidential. And we're delighted to welcome back to this stage the legendary investigative reporter and writer for The New Yorker, Seymour Hirsch. He is, of course, the author of the stunning series, The New Yorker magazine on the use of torture. 
by U.S. military intelligence services in the wake of 9-11 and more recently several pieces also in the New Yorker on Bush administration plans for a war in Iran. Please welcome two indispensable witnesses to our time, Scott Ritter and Cy Hirsch. These mics on, can you all hear us? What I'm gonna do is just do what um, I did the last time I was here, about a year ago, when we were talking about another country, another success story. And um, I guess I'll, um, I'll ask Scott a couple of questions. Before I begin, I guess I'll uh, give you, um, this is sort of a house of God. I'll give you my, my version of a daily prayer, which is the, uh, simply is that, let's see. By my count, uh, the bad news, there's uh, 830 more days left in the reign of King George II. And the good news is that uh, tomorrow morning there'll be one less one, one fewer day. And that's about the only good news we have, folks. Um, uh, if you think you've seen anything, wait till you see George Bush as a lame duck president. But that's not what we're talking about. We don't have to get into how bad it is. It's bad. It's, you know, we might as well just, we're now talking about future bad. Um, so Scott, in your book, you write at some point, uh, you list a, um, you have an account of some of the things that are going on today uh, inside Iran. Uh, you say, um, Israel and the United States were carrying out, this is on page 147, et cetera, were carrying out a full court press to try and identify and locate secret nuclear facilities inside um, uh, Iran. Uh, Israel made heavy use of its connections to the Iraqi Kurdistan and to Azerbaijan to set up covert intelligence cells inside Iran, whose work was allegedly supplemented with specially trained commandos entering Iran disguised as local villagers. The United States was conducting similar operations using Iranian opposition forces, in particular the MEK, that's the Mujahideen cult, which is a terrorist group defined by us as a, uh, an, an one-time anti-Saddam, now anti-Iran group that is, works very closely still with us despite its uh, being listed as a terrorist group. And um, he, 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 you describe um, um, using, um, using opposition, opposition forces inside Iran and the MEK to conduct cross-border operations under the supervision of the CIA. The U.S. has also made use of its considerable technical intelligence collection capabilities, focusing the attention of imagery and electronic eavesdropping, satellites, etc., uh, for operating along Iran's periphery. Uh, the problem was that neither the Israelis nor the United States could detect any activity whatsoever that could point to a definitive location um, on the ground where secret nuclear weapons activity was taking place. A couple questions. Um, says who? I haven't read this in the New York Times. You don't source it. Um, what's the source and what do you know? And how, how do you know this? Well, as I mentioned in the back where I talk about sources, um, most of that information is readily available in the press, not the American press. So you're not going to read about it in the New York Times. Uh, you're not going to read about it in the Washington Post. You probably won't read about it in most mainstream English language newspapers. But, you know, we used to have an organization in the CIA called FBIS, the Foreign Broadcast um, Information Service, that would translate the newspapers of the various nations around the world to give you a literally a bird's eye view of what's going on in that country. So if you read the Azeri press, for instance, you'll find out that uh, the Israeli uh, Mossad has upped its uh, efforts to build a station in Azerbaijan. And the Azeri press will delve into that more. Why does the Mossad want to build a station operating? There's a couple reasons. One, the Mossad is working with the Azeri population, you know, the, there is a Jewish minority in Azerbaijan uh, that has immigrated to Israel. And so there's a number of Azeri Israelis that the Israeli government now is bringing back to Azerbaijan to work this issue. This is spelled out in the Azeri press. So if you want to get some good insights, um, read the Azeri press. Read the Turkish press. The Turkish press will also talk about what's going on in Iran and Azerbaijan. This will give you the leads. And then because I'm not an active in-service intelligence officer anymore, I will take these leads and call friends who are active 
serving intelligence officers. And while they're not going to divulge classified information, I'll say, hey, I read something where certain activities are taking place. Can you uh, comment on this news? We'll sit down over uh, some beers, and they'll comment. And then you dig even further. And I'll tell you that I wrote the book before I went to Iran, but when I got to Iran and I talked to uh, Revolutionary Guard commanders, um, what surprised me is that they knew all this. The Iranians were very cognizant of what was going on in, Azer in, in, in the Azeri section of I I Iran, in the Kurdish section. Uh, they could quote, uh, you know, <laughs> chapter and verse about what the CIA is up to, what the Israelis are up to. But, you know, again, the bottom line is, uh, why don't I footnote this? For probably the same reason why a lot of people don't footnote things. Because if I commit to a specific piece of information coming from a specific written source, that means that another piece of information that I don't commit to a specific written source, where'd that come from? Well, maybe it came from a human source. Now I've just made it easier in this day and age for those who don't want factual information to get in the hands of the average American citizen, those who want to keep American foreign policy and national security policy secret from the Americans they're supposed to be protecting, they'll go after these people. And you know they go after these people. And I'm going to do everything I can to ensure that I don't facilitate harm coming to, from those who have the courage to assist me in trying to get facts out to people so they can know more about this problem we call Iran. Why don't you think the... Uh, why doesn't um, my colleagues in the American press do better with this story? Well, one of the, the, the big problems is, and, and you know, here goes the grenade, uh, Israel. The second you mention the word Israel, uh, the nation Israel, the concept Israel, uh, many in the American press become very defensive. Uh, we're not allowed to be highly critical of the state of Israel. Uh, and when you, and the other thing we're not allowed to do is discuss the notion that Israel and the notion of Israeli interests may in fact be dictating what America is doing. That what we're doing in the Middle East may not be to the benefit of America's national security, but to Israel's national security. But see, we don't want to talk about that because one of the great success stories out there is the pro-Israeli lobby that has successfully enabled uh, themselves to blend the two together so that when we speak of Israeli interests, they say, no, we're speaking of American interests. Um, it's, it's interesting that AIPAC and other um, elements of the Israeli lobby don't have to register as agents of a foreign government. It would be nice if they did because then we'd know when they're advocating on behalf of Israel or they're advocating on behalf of the United States of America. Uh, I would challenge the New York Times to sit down and do a critical story on Israel, on the role of Israel's influence, the role that Israel plays in influencing American foreign policy. There's nothing wrong with Israel trying to influence American foreign policy. Let me make that clear. The British seek to influence our foreign policy. The French seek to influence our foreign policy. The Saudis seek to influence our foreign policy. The difference is when they do this and they bring American citizens into play, these Americans, once they take the money of a foreign government and they advocate on behalf of that foreign government, they register themselves as an agent of that government so we know where they're coming from. That's all I ask the Israelis to do. Let us know where you're coming from because stop confusing the American public that Israel's interests are necessarily America's interests. I have to tell you right now, Israel has a viable, valid concern about Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. If I were an Israeli, I'd be extremely concerned about Hezbollah and I would want to do everything possible to nullify that organization. As an American, I will tell you, Hezbollah does not threaten the national security of the United States of America one iota. So we should not be talking about using American military forces to deal with the Hezbollah issue. That is an Israeli problem, and yet you'll see the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other media outlets confusing the issue. They want us to believe that Hezbollah is an American problem. It isn't, ladies and gentlemen. Hezbollah was created three years after Israel invaded Lebanon, not three years after the United States invaded Lebanon, and Hezbollah's sole purpose was to liberate southern Lebanon from Israeli occupation. I'm not here to condone or sing high praises and virtue for Hezbollah, but I'm here to tell you right now, Hezbollah is not 
a terrorist organization that threatens the security of the United States of America. So in your book, speaking of Israel, it's sort of interesting reading through it. Um, let's see. Essentially, you describe Israel as viewing Iran, the notion of an Iranian nucle nuclear weapon as an existential threat. Uh, you describe how Israel collects intelligence, we could also call it spies, on the International Atomic Energy Agency. This is all sort of um, revelatory stuff in a way. Not the first part, but certainly this, that Israel has penetrated and worked very closely with people inside the IAEA, uh, has apartments, safe houses in Vienna where it does uh, business and basically uh, um, um, uh, operates politically inside the IAEA. Uh, three, uh, you describe in great detail, again, um, I think uh, in more detail than has ever been made public, how much uh, the Israelis have worked very closely with the MEK, the Kolk, this terrorist group that's now pretty much in play again. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, um, in Not only in terms of supporting it um, and urging us, the United States, to support it, but also much of the intelligence, most of the main things that were learned in this administration about the Iranian nuclear weapons programs were announced by MEK officials over the years, particularly in August of 2002. There was a major announcement of the underground facilities, a place that many of you now know were Natanz. And the extent of digging inside Iran was made public by the MEK. And you write in your book repeatedly how Israel was the, was the source for that intelligence and basically was using the MEK to, to proselytize and propagandize in America. Um, you also describe, as we said earlier, uh, extremely uh, active operations by um, uh, Israel inside Iran, collecting uh, running agents, etc., collecting intelligence. So um, tell us about you in Israel. Are you anti-Semitic? Are you anti-Israel? I know you serve there. Tell us about it. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not anti-Semitic, and I'm definitely not anti-Israeli. And you're no. certainly not a self-hating Jew. Let's make that clear. <laughs> no, if, I could be a self-hating Goyim, but uh, <laughs> um, unless there's something in my past we haven't uncovered yet. Like, uh, like some senators, right? But, um, <laughs> but it, it, it's irrelevant. The bottom line is I consider myself to be a friend of, of the state of Israel. I consider myself to be a true friend of the Israeli people. Um, but I define friendship as um, someone who takes care of a friend, who just doesn't use or exploit a friend. Um, and you know, there's that old adage, friends don't let friends drive drunk. We used to use that in the anti-drug campaign, the anti-alcohol campaign. Um, and that's how I view my friendship with Israel. Uh, and when I see a friend preparing to drive drunk or doing something that's going to be harmful to them or to me, I'll say no. I'll say stop. So my criticism of Israel is not from some, you know, you know, Jewish hating, anti-Semitic, uh, you know, foundation of myself. No, as I point out to people, I spent a couple weeks in uh, 1991 um, working with people to stop Iraqi ballistic missiles from landing on Israeli soil. Um, a lot of good Americans lost their lives in that effort, and. Uh, you know, we, we took it serious. I spent four years in Israel working with the Israeli government on the issue of Iraq. I was very close with Israeli intelligence, uh, very close with the Israeli government, and I have a lot of sympathies for them. I know how they work. I know who the players are. And I will say this, if I were Israeli, I'd be doing exactly what they're doing. All right? They have a legitimate concern here. Let's not kid ourselves. It's a small little country. And if a nuclear device goes off inside that small little country, Israel ceased to exist as a viable nation state. They can't afford any room for error. There is no margin of error here. That's why Israel's taken the position that not only will they not tolerate an Iranian nuclear weapons program, they will not tolerate nuclear technology that is usable in a nuclear weapons program, in this case, enrichment technology that Iran is permitted to have under Article 4 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Israel says, no, if Iran can enrich to levels that are usable in a nuclear reactor, that same technology can be used to enrich to levels usable in a nuclear device. Therefore, the Israeli position is not one spinning rotor, meaning not one centrifuge allowed to operate inside Iran. That's a zero 
tolerance policy. Now, Iran's a big country. They carried out a covert program. You know, let's, let's mention this too. When the MEK gave the, gave the briefing in August of 2002, using uh, what many people have said is Israeli information, guess what? They were right. Let's not forget that. They didn't come out and spew garbage. This was not Ahmed Chalabi making stuff up. This is the MEK representative saying there is a facility in the Tons involved in the enrichment of uranium that has been kept secret from the world. And they were right. So let's give a little tip of the hat to the Israeli intelligence community for getting it right. But there's a difference between getting the intelligence right and getting the policy right. And I will tell you right now that the Israelis have the policy wrong because they have created a, a system of analysis that deviates from the lessons learned from the Yom Kippur War. At the end of the Yom Kippur War, they basically said there will be no more conceptia, meaning we're going to have a concept of what the enemy thinks. We're going to conceive what the enemy thinks, project what the enemy thinks. And they got it wrong. They projected that the Egyptians would never attack on the dates that people talked about. Next thing you know, you got the third Egyptian army rolling across the Sinai, and the Israelis got serious problems. They said it will be faked fact-based analysis from now on. And we will double-check and we will triple-check. One of the more interesting Israelis I met was the Doubting Thomas. He's the guy, he's a colonel. All information that went to the Director of Military Intelligence came through him, all assessments. He sat down and picked them apart. And basically, if you made an assertion, he said, how do you know this? If you said X, he said, why isn't it Y? And you had to answer him. You had to come back and explain this. And only then did the policy get or the analysis get to the director of military intelligence, who is the head of national assessments in Israel. He then takes it to the prime minister. So imagine that, being the head of state, getting quality intelligence from your intelligence community that's been double-checked, triple-checked, questioned, so there's no room for error. But an interesting thing happened in the, in, in the aftermath of the, the, the Gulf War. Some personalities took over. One in particular I write about in the book, Amos Gilad. Uh, then a brigadier general, I think he left as a major general. But Amos Gilad brought back into fruition the notion of conceptia. You see, he conceived the notion of a nexus combining Iran with Hezbollah with Hamas. And he said, Israel is at threat. This whole thing is lumped together and we have to deal with it all. And the head that has to be cut off if we're going to succeed is Iran. Iran is the threat. Iran is the problem. Iran must be dealt with. And he started slanting the intelligence assessments that were being presented to the Director of Military Intelligence, this time on what I'll call faith-based analysis. His gut feeling, his belief, but not the facts. This isn't sound, factually-based analysis. This is a deviation. And unfortunately, the politicians bought off on it. And again, because we have yet today to be able to separate in the American policy formulation that involves Israel separate Israeli interests from American interests, the Israeli government has been very successful in using the pro-Israeli lobby to make sure that the Israeli concerns, the Israeli point of view, becomes the American point of view, and that's what's happening here. But yes, Israel has agents operating inside Iran. They better have agents operating inside Iran. I wish we had more agents operating inside Iran so we knew more was going on. Can you blame Israel? because they care about nuclear weapons, for trying to get close to the International Atomic Energy Agency? We do it. Well, uh, why is the world surprised that Israel is going to do it? When you have inspectors that go into a nation that you have deemed hostile, you want to know what they know. You also want to help guide them. Israel did this in Iraq, and I have to say it was very honorable what they did. They didn't go in to corrupt the inspection process. They went in to improve, to enhance the inspection process. But with Iraq, it was fact-based analysis. That's why at the end of the day, the Israeli government was willing to accept that Iran had been virtually disarmed, that almost all the WMD had been accounted for. In 1998, that was the assessment. Thanks to Amos Gilad, by 2003, Iraq's weapons of mass destruction had been reborn. And he didn't have to explain how they had been reborn. It was conceptia. It was a gut feeling. They were there because Saddam's bad. The same thing's happening with Iran today, because all of this intelligence work that's being done has uncovered a nuclear enrichment program, not a nuclear weapons program. But the Israelis have already concluded, 
thanks to Amos Gilad and his conceptia, that a nuclear weapons program exists. Therefore, if you're not finding evidence of it, that means you're not looking in the right places. So then you begin to speculate. How many people here remember underground facilities in Iraq? Saddam's tunnels, everything buried. Well, there weren't any, were there? Well, guess what? The Israelis talk about tunnels in Iran, and there are tunnels in Iran. The Iranians have been working with the North Koreans for the last couple of decades to perfect deep tunneling techniques, and they are boring in the ground. You saw all those little Hezbollah tunnels in South uh, Lebanon that were so effective against the Israelis? They were dug by the Iranians with North Korean assistance. That comes from the Iranians themselves. And they're doing the same thing in Iran today. And the Israelis are detecting this deep tunneling activity. And they're sending elements in to do reconnaissance on that. But they're not finding any evidence of nuclear-related activity because there isn't any going on. But again, thanks to Concepcia, Gilad, and, and, and the way the Israelis now do their assessments, they immediately equate deep tunneling and a nuclear enrichment program to mean that there is a secret underground nuclear weapons program. Faith-based analysis has trumped fact-based analysis, and because of the pressure put on American policymakers by the Israeli lobby, our own government has now embraced this point of view. And this is very dangerous, ladies and gentlemen, because if we accept at face value without question the notion of a nuclear weapons program in Iran, that means the debate's over. It's over, because if Iran has a nuclear weapons program that operates in violation of international law, it's very easy for American policymakers to talk about the imperative to confront this. And if you can't confront it successfully diplomatically, that leaves only the military option on the table. And right now, that's the direction we're heading, because the debate's over, apparently, about whether or not Iran has a nuclear weapons program, even though the IAEA has come out and said there's no evidence whatsoever to sustain the Bush administration's allegations that such a weapons program exists. Note, I didn't say that the IAEA said there is no such weapons program. They can't prove that. But note, the Bush administration has taken this and now changed course, like they did with Iraq. Saddam said, we don't have any weapons. The inspectors aren't finding any weapons. Keep looking. Why? Because the onus isn't on the inspectors to find the weapons. The onus is on Iraq to prove that none exist. But how can you prove a negative? And the same thing is in play today with Iran. We have told the Iranians it is their responsibility to prove to the international community, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there is no nuclear weapons program in Iran. How can you prove a negative? But that's not the point, because it's not about a nuclear weapons program. It's about regime change and the Bush administration using the perception of threat from a nuclear weapons program to achieve their ultimate objective of regional transformation, which is, again, a policy born more in Tel Aviv than Washington, D.C. Um, okay. Uh. <laughs> Digression. One of the things you and I used to talk about was when Scott was an inspector uh, from 91 to 98, he got in a lot of trouble, an awful lot of trouble with his government because he would take highly classified information to Israel to be analyzed first, remember? Particularly some of the overhead stuff, U2 stuff. And um, uh, that caused you a lot of um, uh, investigations, a lot of problems in terms of just uh, loyalty issues. But still, the fact is you thought so highly of Israel. I remember you telling me years ago, that they could do, they could understand what was going on from satellite photographs in six or seven hours. If you gave it to the American system, we were dealing in a week and you would get a bad analysis. Um, no, that's just, a, you had a lot, of, a lot of faith in their intelligence uh, capability. So what the hell is going on there? Is it as simple as that? It's just simple as a, a few people at the top playing Ahmed Chalabi? Or is it, what, what happened? Why aren't, they, why aren't they calling it the way, um, if you're right, they should? Well, again, I, I think it comes down to, you know, we, we keep, the Bush administration likes, likes to talk a lot about the nexus, the nexus between weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. Um, I'll talk about the nexus between the neoconservatives in Washington, D.C. and the right wing of the Likud party in Israel. Uh, these, these elements, these political elements, have been working hand in glove for, for many, many years. And now that the neoconservatives in Washington, D.C. have seized power, or have gained power, attained power, um, <laughs> uh, that now that they're in power, the, um, 
the, the right wing in Israel has to play this game. Has to, they have to deal with the, the cards that they've been dealt. And, um, and so they're, you know, they're not going to stand up to the United States. You're not going to sit there and try and encourage the United States to make a move on Iran using fact-based information. You've got to understand there's certain buttons you need to push in Washington, D.C. To, to get American politicians to move in a certain direction. And um, you've know, you got to keep it simple. And the simplest thing is to say that there is a nuclear weapons program in Iran. And then you've got to push some more buttons because you don't want to treat that in isolation. You want to complicate it further. That nuclear weapons program is in the hands of a nation that is a state sponsor of terror, Iran. And the terrorist organizations that they sponsor are inclusive of Hezbollah, Hamas, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Fatah Wing. This is all part of the same problem, you see. And in doing so, Israel now complicates America's overall policy posture vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East, because now it becomes very difficult to treat the Palestinian situation in isolation. It becomes very difficult to treat the Hezbollah situation in isolation, or to treat Iran in isolation. Israel has lumped it all together because they know how to play the American political game I think better than we know how to play the American political game. So this is about domestic politics trumping intelligence and sound analytical processes. So do you, I think a lot about the neocons. And what's interesting about the neocons and their influence, as you say, is that if you look at it in the last few years, they really lost a lot of the intellectual leadership uh, from direct, direct policy input. Wolfowitz is gone. Uh, Richard Pearl certainly was no longer head of the Defense Policy Board. He's on the outside. Douglas Feith, who was an Undersecretary of Defense and very important um, to Rumsfeld, is gone. Um, so with some of their more important acolytes out of the way, why are we still talking about the neocons? What is it about us that enables them to keep on going, even though many of their leaders, nobody would define either uh, Bush or Cheney or Rumsfeld as neocons before before 2001. They were just realist conservatives. Where, how have we gotten to? What's your guess about it? I mean, I don't have an answer. Do you have an answer? Well, I don't have a definitive answer, but I would say this: um, if you if you want to attribute anything to the empowerment of the neoconservatives, attribute eight years of Clinton presidency. Uh, you see, the neoconservatives um, had had thrived under the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Uh, because we had an evil empire back then, you see. We had an enemy, a focal point. And so they could sit there and talk about global hegemony, talk about global domination, uh, and no one would hold them to task because it was widely recognized that we were engaged in a global struggle with another global superpower. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the neoconservative thinkers, these global hegemonists, said we can't allow any power, group of powers, to step into that vacuum. This is 1991-1992. In fact, in 1992, under the direction of Dick Cheney, who was at that time the Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz and uh, Scooter Libby helped author a vision statement, uh, a policy statement for the Defense Department that talked about how we divide the world into spheres of strategic influence and how we will intervene unilaterally, prevent preemptively, militarily, if required, to dominate these regions. And that's what we need to do with the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, there's a little hiccup uh, along the way of that becoming policy called an election where George Herbert Walker Bush, the heir to Ronald Reagan, got defeated. And Bill Clinton came in. And when Clinton came in, all these neoconservative ideologues who had been shaping and influencing policy for 12 years were no longer in power. And what they did is they all went off to roost in various neoconservative or conservative or right-leaning think tanks. And they festered for eight years. Uh, perfecting this poison that became their policy. And then when George Bush, George Walker Bush, be got elected, they came in and assumed power. But they had eight years to basically put a spit shine on their vision of how the world would look. And they didn't have an easy time early on. There was a lot of hiccups. So if you remember in the summer of 2001, how critical people were of the Bush administration, of Donald Rumsfeld, of these neoconservative thinkers, because their ideology wasn't melding with the post-Clinton reality. Thanks to September 11, 2001, 
19 criminals who hijacked four airplanes and flew them into three buildings in a farm field, all that changed. The neoconservatives were successfully able to exploit the ignorance-based fear of the American public to sell them a bill of goods about the world we live in, and as a result, they had a seamless transition from an ideology that America should reject at face value and in how has become the official policy of the United States of America, the national security policy or strategy of the United States of America. First promulgated in September 2002, most recently updated in June 2006. This policy is almost word for word the same doctrine that Wolfowitz penned in 1992, that the Project for a New American Century put out in 1997, and it is now that which defines how America interfaces with the rest of the world. But, but Scott, answer the question, um, if they fester, why are they festering? Why do they continue to have this influence? Uh, you have mentioned another one that's gone, Libby. When so many of the intellectual gurus of that, you know, that group, I and mean, certainly Wolfowitz, um, and Libby was very important too, why are they, why, given the collapse of policy in Iraq, which is becoming increasingly obvious to everyone, um, why are we still there? Why is, why is this country still basically, you know, neo, the policies of the country still neoconservative? What, what, what's, what has been festered? What has been inculcated in us? What, what's going on? Well, again, the reason why I talk about the festering is to point out that they had 12 years of being in power, followed by eight years of being able to take their policy to think tanks and, and work on it. So that's 20 years that the neoconservatives were able to develop and Yeah, but we've got a ideology. constitution, we've got a Congress, what's, we've got a press, we've got a bureaucracy, what's going on? Because uh, on September 11th, the United States of America suffered its worst defeat. Not at the hands of terrorists, but at the hands of the neoconservatives, who basically allowed the terrorists to win by turning America on itself. We have a Congress, but Congress only counts when it functions. And when Congress refuses to carry out appropriate oversight, when Congress refuses to hold the President accountable for policy decisions, when Congress stands by and idly while we violate international law and indeed the Constitution of the United States invading a sovereign state without just cause, allowing the torturing of individuals to occur by American service members, when Congress sits by and tolerates warrantless wiretappings, they don't function as okay, a legitimate but, branch of government. Okay, but let's just, let's, just, let's just go back. We all agree on Congress. But the fact is that um, when Omar was here in May, the Prime Minister of Israel, and gave a speech about Iran to a joint session of Congress, um, the big applause lines, the standing O's came when he criticized Iran and, and raised the specter. We, the same language you're talking about, this existential language, this threat. And that was a standing ovation. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, no matter how you describe it, no matter how we perceive it, uh, if the president orders a military attack on Iran, Congress will rubber stamp it. There's no question about that. And in my view, I don't know what you think. I, I, and, the, and, and I guess heuristically, if you will, um, what's your guess? What do you, we, gotta, we, gotta, we wanna do a lot of questions because um, um, uh, there may be somebody here who disagrees with what Scott's saying. <laughs> um, it takes an awful lot of courage. Well, but anyway. not to be controversial. So. <laughs> um, but um, so um, what's your guess? Um, uh, what happens? Uh, well, you're, October surprise no. next year. What do you think? What do you think? What's in line for us? Well, first of all, let, let's let's start with what you're talking about: the standing ovation that Omer gets. Why? Why would he get the standing ovation? Because the United States of America has been preconditioned since 1979 to accept at face value anything negative said about the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, there's a lot of negative things that can be said about the Islamic Republic of Iran, but unfortunately, by allowing ourselves to create this filter that says we don't recognize anything positive, only the negative, we create the conditions where we don't question negative data. And therefore, when people say Iran is a threat, we agree. And this has been going on since 1979. So 
The American public, and indeed the American Congress, is preconditioned for war, for confrontation with Iran. That's why we can have a policy that transitions from dual containment under the Clinton administration to regime change under the Bush administration without any significant debate taking place whatsoever. And because this condition exists, there will be war with Iran unless a little miracle occurs called the Democrats winning Congress, creating enough friction to stop the war in, to, in the November elections. But even if that occurs, as you pointed out, uh, there is no separation between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party on the issue of Iran. Everybody sits there and says, wait a minute, we're losing the war in Iraq, and there's 65 percent of the population that's uh, turned against this war. Certainly, we're not going to go to war with Iran. Again, I mean to correct the American public here. 65 percent of the American public aren't anti-war. They're just anti-losing. You see, if we were winning the war in Iraq, they'd all be for it. If we had brought democracy, they'd be cheering the president. It wouldn't matter that we violated international law. It wouldn't be matter that we lied about weapons of mass destruction. We'd be winning. God bless America. Ain't we good? USA, USA. But we're losing. So they're against Iraq. But what happens when you get your butt kicked in one game? You're looking for the next game where you can win. And right now, we're looking for Iran for a victory. We're going to go to war with Iran. When? Not in October. I'll tell you that. There's a couple things that have to happen before we go to war uh, with Iran. There has to be a serious diplomatic offensive to secure the military basing required to support the aerial forces necessary for sustained bombardment and the logistic apparatus that goes along with that. The fuel, the bombs, the support personnel, the maintenance. We haven't done that. We're doing it. There has to be political preparation here at home. The Bush administration is not a dictatorship yet. They still have to go to Congress, and they still have to get a degree of congressional approval for military operations against Iran. Uh, not that much, though. I mean, everybody is aware that after 9-11, Congress pretty much gave the Bush administration a blank check to wage war any way they saw fit, so long as it dealt with the global war on terror. And the president... Be, be specific. The October 2002 um, um, resolution calling was not just limited to Iraq. It, you're no, exactly it's a, right. It's a global it was, war on terror. It, it gave him the right... To, he's got a blank check. He does a have A blank that. check to do it. Now, That's literally he, correct. He has to be smart about this. Uh, to Yes, he can wage war, but... He needs to ensure that Congress continues to fund the war. So that's why he will go to Congress. He will make the case for Iran. But as I said, Congress has already pre-programmed to nod their head yes and stamp anything he signs. The most important thing is the American military, getting the American military positioned. The easy thing is getting the Air Force's position, the Naval Force and Air Force that will do the bombardment. The hard thing is getting the American military leadership to go along with that, and that might be the one little glimmer of hope that's out there, because if we can get a Democratic-controlled Congress that is not afraid to exercise its oversight responsibility and holds hearings where it brings in military professionals and liberates them to speak critically of bad policy, which is the duty and responsibility of every general officer. There's a gross dereliction of duty taking place today in the United States where our general officers remain mute while they are in active duty. Suddenly when they retire, they get great courage. They can speak out. But you know what? It's too late. Too many of your men have died. You should have spoke out sooner. And hopefully with a Democratic Congress, the generals will speak out. Look at the, the standards set by the British military. The British chief of staff has come out and finally spoke truth to power by saying, Mr. Blair, your war is not only not winnable, but it's destroying the British army. And if we want to have an army in five to ten years, we have to change our policy. Maybe American generals will uh, follow that Precedent. I've had some smart Arabs I know who are not uh, anti-American per se, but increasingly, of course, uh, getting that way, say to me that one other, there's another, they had another vestige of hope, which was that after the disaster in Lebanon, and there's some, the Israelis are sort of now, they, their position is, a, is we suffered a technical knockout. It wasn't a complete knockout. They're finding a little grace in it. But the, some of the bright Arabs I know said, maybe the Israelis will move to the center. Maybe that one way will save us, save us being the world in their view, certainly the oil world in the Middle East from continued war. And they said, 
perhaps giving up on the notion that America would move, but maybe the Israeli population would move to the center. No sign yet of it. I don't see it. Well, there, there is a significant, I mean, that, that's one of the things that strikes me when I travel to Israel. It's like anything, traveling to Iran. You suddenly have this veil lifted because, of course, you're not going to get a true picture from the American media about what Iran is. And most Americans, I don't think, have a genuine picture of what Israel is. Uh, unless you've gone to Israel, traveled to Israel, met the Israelis. It's a very diverse society. It's not uh, homogeneous at all, especially political. You know, you, you, you sit three Israelis down around a table, you get seven different opinions. Um, and and that, that's the truth. These, these people love politics, they're concerned, they're engaged, and there is a viable, powerful, uh, moderate, and progressive element within Israel. Um, he, the, the, the battle with Hezbollah uh, this past summer, this conflict in so, South Lebanon that bled over into northern Israel, um, could go either way. Uh, on the one hand, there are elements that are seeking to exploit the fear factor, the fact that thousands of Hezbollah rockets landed on Israel to say, never again, never again, we must redouble our efforts to confront. But taking a look at how enfeebled the, the, the Israeli military was in its response, how Hezbollah was actually empowered, the Israelis might actually come to realize the lesson we're learning in Iraq, which is you cannot militarily defeat an organization that has as its roots the legitimate concerns of an indigenous population. And I'm not here to condone Hezbollah or sing its virtues, but I will tell you this, Hezbollah is an organization of southern Lebanese Shia. They belong in South Lebanon, they're in South Lebanon, and Israel may have learned a hard lesson that you just can't bomb these people into submission, ha ham standing. so they might move to the center. Ham standing. We, got, we, we want to do one more question. Let me ask them one more question. One last question, um, which is, okay, and briefly, um, uh, we go to war. We begin a massive bombing campaign, take your pick. Um, odds are it's going to be uh, systematic, at least three days of intense bombing. Uh, decapitation probably, which uh, that is one of the things you do when you begin a bombing attack like we did against Saddam twice and like the Israelis did against uh, Hezbollah when they targeted Nasrallah. And I think we and the Israelis are now 0 for 8, almost as bad as Shrummy and his elections. But anyway, um, so the question then is, um, we go to war. Um, what's, tell us what happens next, in your view. Well, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's almost impossible to be 100% correct, but I'll give you my best analysis. Um, the Iranians will use the weapon that um, is the most effective weapon, because the key for Iran you know, Iran can't afford, if this, remember, the regime wants to stay in power. So they can't afford a strategy that gets the American people to recognize three years in that, oops, we made a mistake. I mean, if that was Saddam's strategy, it failed for him because he's out of power. Yeah, we realize we made a mistake now in Iraq, but the regime's gone. So the Iranians realize that they have to inflict pain up front. The pain is not going to be inflicted militarily because we're not going to commit numbers of ground forces on the, on the ground that can, that can cause that pain. The pain will come economically. Our oil-based economy is operating on the margins as we speak. We only have 1 to 1 1.5 percent excess production capacity. If you take the Iranian oil off the market, which is the first thing the Iranians will do, we automatically drop to around minus 4 percent, which means there ain't enough oil out there to support the globe's thirst for oil. Uh, especially America's thirst for oil. And we're not the only ones drinking it. You think for a second the Chinese and the Indians, the, the world's two largest developing economies, are going to say, hey, Uncle Sam, we'll put everything on hold so we can divert oil resources so you can feed your oil addiction because you attacked Iraq, Iran. And it's not just Iranian oil will go off the market. Why do you think we sent minesweepers up there? We've got to keep the Straits of Hormuz open. The Iranians will shut it down that quick. They'll also shut down oil production in the... Um, in, in, in the um, Western oil fields of Saudi Arabia, they'll shut down Kuwaiti oil production, they'll shut down oil production in the United Arab Emirates, they'll shut down whatever remaining oil production there is in Iraq. They'll launch a massive attack using their Shia proxies in Iraq against American forces. That will cause bloodshed. The bottom line is, within two days of our decision to initiate an attack on Iran, every single one of you is going to be feeling the consequences of that in your pocketbook. And it's only going to get worse. This is not something that only I recognize. Ask Dick Luger what information he's getting from big business who are saying, we can't afford to go to war with Iran. Final question. Given all this, 
Are we going to do it? Yes, we're going to do it. Um, because, again, the American people haven't yet found the means to, A, educate and inform themselves about the reality of Iran, and B, hold their elected representatives accountable for policies and decisions made in their name. All right, this is a, an audience that is uh, itching to ask you questions, both of you, and they are all wonderful. Let me just go through them and ask you to uh, respond briefly, if possible. Um, <laughs> it's not a personality comment. It's a difficult topic. Uh, in view of the uh, unwavering commitment of Israel not to not allow Iraq or Iran to enrich uranium, how do you explain Israel's silence on Pakistan, a Muslim country? Ought we to read their silence as evidence that Pakistan's nukes have been dismantled or neutralized? And parallel question, why is Bush letting Pakistan off the hook, considering it's accused of helping North Korea and Iran in their nuclear programs? We can all answer that. Um... Uh, in a nutshell, if I was a Pakistani anyway, I would, and they probably, um, this may be a little hard to grab onto, but um, one of the things about the Pakistans that's frighteningly true is they think they're next. They think we're going to be coming after them. I would venture that um, if Musharraf goes south, which he could, there'll be a traffic jam between Israeli commandos, American commandos, Indian commandos, <laughs> trying to dismantle and grab as many of the warheads you want. So there's been an awful lot of work. And one of the major intelligence things we do is find out where the nukes are in Iran and Pakistan and keep them. It, but the answer, of course, is total hypocrisy I'm towards it, of course, because um, that's just, um, it's also obvious. You know, um, the only problem with all these rational discussions um, doesn't matter a, a damn because he's going, to do what he, he's going to do what he wants to do, whether it's because of God or his father or what, um, or step 12, you know. Um. <laughs> so uh, then the, the follow-up question would be uh, for, I guess, step 13. If, if uh, Democrats were to uh, take either the House or the Senate, uh, would they be effective in uh, derailing this uh, freight train? <laughs> I think we have our answer. Um, the, the, the bottom line is no, because we're not, we're not getting rid of the Democrats we need to get rid of. I mean, if Hillary Clinton is reelected, and she will be, um, she's somebody who is a vocal advocate for forceful confrontation uh, of, of Iran. So how is empowering the Democratic Party going to, uh, to change the policy? The key Democrats... Like I said, there is no separation between the key Democrats and the key Republicans on the issue of Iran. Scott, what, what, uh, what would your suggestion be to solving diplomatic impasse with I Iran from the U.S. point of view, and is verification possible? Well, let's, let's take the easy part first. Is verification possible? Absolutely. The inspection regime that the IAEA is capable of putting together is one of the finest the world has ever seen. Uh, they've already proven their capability and their mettle in confronting Iran. They uncovered a, a sequence of lies and inconsistencies, and at the end of the day, the science won out. That's why we know as much as we do. So let's give these guys their chance. Guess what happens during an inspection? Nobody dies. It's a good thing. I like inspections because <laughs> nobody dies. Um, and what was the first part? The, the hard part? <laughs> uh, your prescription for uh, prescription alternative of use of force. Well, the first thing is let's stop talking about Ahmadinejad. Okay, the man's an idiot. Okay, we accept that. The man speaks irresponsibly. We accept that. Well, let's deal with the reality of it. He has no power. None whatsoever. So when we speak of diplomacy, let's eliminate the man who has no power, no influence, and talk about who does, which is the supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei. Let's talk about the Guardian Council. Let's talk about the Expediency Council. Let's talk about the fact that in 2003, this troika sent a letter via the Swiss Embassy to the United States government 
offering not only the normalization of relations between the United States and Iran, but also a negotiated peace settlement between Iran and Israel, and they were willing to put their nuclear program on the table. This was rejected by the Bush administration because they don't want to do anything that facilitates keeping the theocracy in power. It's all about regime change. I believe George Bush on diplomacy when he puts Condoleezza Rice's butt on an airplane, flies her to Tehran, and she sits down with the people that count instead of running around the world giving lip service to Ahmadinejad. I, but, whoa, 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 whoa. Not everybody agrees, Scott. There are some people in, in, in certainly not, not so much in the American intelligence, but some of our allies who think that actually because of, um, uh, of some of this, that, that he is more popular, Ahmadinejad, and also that he does have more influence, that it's not totally clear that he's completely without power, that he has certainly his power, whatever it was, it certainly was marginal in the beginning, has grown because of his widespread popularity. And the street in, in uh, Egypt, for example, Nasrullah, uh, not surprisingly, is, is, is the man of the hour, but Ahmadinejad is number two in popularity on the street, in the Arab world. And so, um, he is accumulating some power. I agree with you that um, it was very interesting during this last trip. Don't forget Caracas, too, because just to talk about how dangerous the world is, if we do hit Iran, there's no question that Chavez will pull his oil off the market. And there's a real big question, in, 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 just to stick another blow, and he sells a couple million barrels a day to American companies under American contract. It's not clear what, how we, we, the Bush administration, would respond to Caracas doing that. And so that could be a real mess. It's not, you know, that we could be looking at a, another serious, serious, that sort of un overlooked pro program. We're not going to tolerate him not fulfilling contracts. The odds are high. Um, you mentioned two, two and a half million barrels off the market. He'll take another two million off in, 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 in support. But still, um, Ahmadinejad was flying around. He, was, he went to Caracas, he went to Cuba, he came here to the UN. And at, at a critical moment in talks with the EU, Lara Jami, who's the representative for Iran on nuclear issues, when he had an issue, he flew from, I think, Geneva, where you're seeing the uh, meeting with the EU. Uh, he flew back home. He didn't come to see Ahmadinejad. So there's some real reason to think that Ahmadinejad is not the big power. But I wouldn't dismiss, dismiss him as influence as much as you did. I, I, I think he's certainly much more influential than he was six months ago. Well, I'll give him the influence, but constitutionally he has no power. And uh, regardless of what the Iranian people on the street think, at the end of the day, the Iranian constitution is very specific about who controls the military, who controls the police, and who controls the nuclear program. So is our constitution, and look where it is. So there you are. <laughs> Let's go on. You always get the easy ones. <laughs> Scott, I, I assume that your reference to um, the Secretary of State's butt is an indication that you, your service was not in the, in the diplomatic corps. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for Sai, do you think the Arabs are so anti-Persian that they won't mind Israel and or the U.S. attacking Iran to avoid Iranian hegemony? Well, you keep on hearing from the people in the administration that oh my God, don't worry about it, secretly and privately, the Saudis and the Egyptians and the Jordanians are saying, bring it on, as they did in 91. They urged us to go in 91, in the first in Gulf War I. So you hear repeatedly that inside the administration they're getting all sorts of signs that the, the Sunni leaders of those countries want to see the, uh, the Shiite regime in Iran, as you say, the Persian, non-Arab, uh, they want to see them diminished. Um, uh, you know, what, one of the real tragedies of, of the press coverage we have is I, 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 I write a lot about Iran and I'm still doing it. I'm still in the middle of stuff. So um, let me just say that I talk to a lot of people in the intelligence community. And we have a lot of good people in our, biz, in our country. Not everybody is. They're not all, this is not all Cheney madness. There's some very good people who are very frustrated, obviously. Everybody I know has read very carefully every speech uh, Nasrallah has made, particularly his September 22nd speech. If you remember, there was a headline about he talked something about having his rockets back, 20,000 rockets. 20,000 rockets were back. There was a half a million people he spoke to. Well, the text of that speech 
was uh, uh, everybody, everybody I respect in the government has knows everything Nasrallah says, views him as the most important figure going on right now, very restrained, believe it or not, in his, in, in his speeches, and making the point that um, we've done something. We've, we've beheaded the monster. We've actually won a war. We planned, uh, we thought, and we dug in, and we did what we had to do, and we've, we've hurt Israel. We've, we've crimped their style. Their arrogance has been cut back. And so what does Nasrallah say? He said, it's time for my, fellows, my, fellow, uh, my fellow Arabs, and he's Lebanese, in, in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia, and uh, in Egypt. It is time for them to join us on the next real issue, the next important issue. We must work together and do what we did in southern Lebanon, in the West Bank and Gaza. We must do something about the Palestinian issue, which is really interesting for a lot of people if that's going to be the next sort of goal, because the Israelis certainly have been uh, um, not beheaded, but they've been, they've been reduced in stature um, without seeming to lose much of the hubris. And so that's what's, what alarms me is to see what's going on in Israel. The move to the right, he's probably going to take in Lieberman, uh, the, the Russian. He's going to, not, not, not the Connecticut, the Russian, the, 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 although, you know. We'd all vote him all there. Right. Okay. Well, anyway. let, me just, let me just add one, one thing to that. The, um, this is a ray of hope, the silver lining in the cloud. What a uh, Revolutionary Guard guy said, uh, why don't you Americans realize that we hate Arabs more than we hate the Israelis and that we'd rather work with Israel to contain Arab power than to work with the Arabs to contain Israeli well, power. There's a long history, you know, of that. Of yeah, I know, Israel. but we don't recognize that. We, we sit, we, we, again, because of our ignorance, we go Muslim. They're all the same. They're not all the same. Uh, Scott, um, since the time that both India and Pakistan showed that they had nuclear weapons, those two nations with a long history of fighting have not gone to war. Is it possible that a nuclear-armed Iran could make the region safer? Well, again, the problem with that premise, that statement, is that it offers as a premise a nuclear-armed Iran. Um, in order for there to be a nuclear-armed Iran, uh, the Iranian government would have to reverse course on its stated policy. Remember, we have yet to establish that there is a nuclear weapons program in Iran. So why are we giving them a nuclear bomb or a nuclear capability that they have not only said they don't want, but we don't have any evidence of them having? I would say that if Iran developed a nuclear weapon, that means that they have reversed policy direction. And then we have to ask ourselves, why have they reversed policy direction? And I would be very concerned about an Iranian reversal of policy direction because I don't think that it would be leading towards just holding on to a bomb, sitting on the bomb. If Iran changes direction and decides that they need a bomb, I have a funny feeling that it's not going to be a bomb that's going to sit in the basement. It's going to be a bomb that's going to sit on top of a missile. And that missile is going to be on a mobile launch platform, pre-positioned, where it can be launched against targets in the Middle East. And no, the world would not be safer with a nuclear weapon on an Iranian missile in a volatile region like this. So I think we should do everything we can to keep the Iranians on the policy track that they claim to be on and all the evidence dictates they are on, one that rejects nuclear weapons. Remember, the Iranians condemned the North Korean weapons tests. The Iranians continue to say that nuclear weapons are incompatible with basic humanity and the Islamic religion. Let's take that at face value and get Condoleezza Rice's butt on an airplane to Tehran where she can negotiate but a you peaceful know, resolution. You know, in, your, in your book, Scott, you also make another very interesting point about just about the sort of illogic of the American position. Um, you write somewhere in this book, which is, which is a very serious, dense account of American policy towards Iran. It's very complete. Um, um, uh, you say that if the Bush administration really does believe, as they seem to, that Iran has a bomb and is committed to it, their negotiating position makes no sense because they're, they're sitting around negotiating with the EU about limiting, you know, small centrifuge cascades, small little production plants, when if they really think there's a serious program, it's, it's, an, it's a complete illogical um, way to negotiate, which yeah. is fascinating to me. It's something that, you know, uh, in other words, 
even if you take what they say at face value, what they're doing about it doesn't make sense even. You well, know? we saw that with Iraq, where they said that Saddam Hussein was sitting on massive stockpiles of chemical weapons, biological weapons, and reconstituted a nuclear weapons program, but we invaded. We didn't do anything about the WMD. We just sort of went in and went, oops, uh, yeah, we're, well, yeah, we'll, we'll send in this, uh, this, this artillery brigade that will, uh, will decommission an artillery brigade, train up in a couple of weeks to be a weapons of mass destruction unit, and they'll go in and look for WND. But they had no clue what they were looking for. Why is that the case? Because we knew there was oh, well. no threat. And I'm going to tell you, we know there is no nuclear weapons threat well, from Iran. The, we know the, it. The uh, policymakers may not know it, but the intelligence community knows it. Again, you can fault the president if he really believed there was weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. When we invaded, they did nothing to dismantle them. That's or, what I'm I mean, and in other words, by invading, you would make the risk of using it much greater. And they, they did nothing to stop that, which is illogical. But I do believe, I, I, you know, I wish I could tell you that I, my guess about Bush is um, he believes everything he's saying. And that is really scary. Well, like I said, we're supposed to not function as a dictatorship but a representative democracy where we have a system of governance that um, allows other voices other than the president to weigh in on critical issues. He, he does. He has Cheney. War. Cheney weighs in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, to both of you, uh, given your knowledge of uh, the thinking behind the headlines and behind the scenes and the research that you both have been doing uh, of late on the uh, question beyond Iraq, uh, how close, in your judgment, are we to the use of atomic weapons? Well, it was, I, I know I wrote about it, and it was, it was in one of the early plans because the White House wanted the Joint Chiefs, who are, you know, absolutely functions of, of the National Command Authorities, and they do what the President tells them to do. I guess the, really the chain of command runs through the Chairman, really, more, Pete Pace. Um, it certainly was in a plan. And the military won a considerable victory uh, uh, this spring, early this spring, by objecting vigorously with, and threatening resignations. And it's not, when you talk about resignations at the Joint Chiefs, I don't mean the, the Joint Chiefs, but at, at the staff level, you're talking about people retiring early. And um, they, they did win that small concession from the President. But I will tell you that um, uh, if Scott is right and what he says will happen if we invade, that is with Iran firing missiles at various oil facilities in the Middle East and even at Israel. Um, you can't, you know, Israel does have 600 or so nuclear weapons. And the whole problem with the problem, the whole notion of, it's also sort of so overwhelming. You've got all these countries in the Middle East that have nada, and you have this one country that has 600. I mean, you, and we're not even beginning to talk about some rational disarmament program um, but just imagine if everything was hunky-dory and we resolved all the problems of the Palestinian crisis and we worked out some sort of agreement to everybody's satisfaction. Uh, God knows what that would be, but we're not there. Uh, you would still be confronted with an overwhelmingly difficult issue, which is one country in the Middle East is bristling with nuclear arms and the others don't have any, with the exception of uh, Pakistan, which is close. Um, and so we aren't even getting to the core issue with all of this stuff we're doing now. And nothing this administration has done. Of course, they've moved us even farther along off the path. Um, it's a really lousy world we're leaving for our children and grandchildren. I'll say, I'll say this about nuclear weapons. You know, I'm, I'm not sitting at the Joint, Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'm not in on the planning. Uh, I'll take it at face value that the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff in the, in the Joint Chiefs of Staff successfully eliminated nuclear weapons in the initial phase of, of, of an operation. But keep in mind this, that the Bush administration has built a new generation of nuclear weapons that we call usable nukes. Um, and they have a nuclear you know, posture now which permits the preemptive use of nuclear weapons in a non-nuclear environment if the Commander-in-Chief deems U.S. forces to be at significant risk. If we start bombing Iran, I'm telling you right now, it's not going to work. We're not going to achieve decapitation, regime change, all that. Um, what will happen is the Iranians will respond, and we will feel the pain instantaneously, which will prompt the Bush administration to move to phase two, which will have to be boots on the ground. 
and we will put boots on the ground. We will surge a number of divisions in, probably through Azerbaijan, down the Caspian Sea coast, in an effort to push the regime over. And when they don't push over, we now have 40,000 troops trapped. We have now reached the definition of significant numbers of U.S. troops in harm's way, and there is no reserve to pull them out. There's no more cavalry to come riding to the rescue. And at that point in time, my concern is that we will use nuclear weapons to break the backbone of Iranian resistance, and it may not work. But what it will do is this. It will unleash the nuclear genie. And so for all those Americans out there tonight who say, you know what, taking on Iran is a good thing. I just told you if we take on Iran, we're going to use nuclear weapons. And if we use nuclear weapons, the genie ain't going back in the bottle until an American city is taken out by an Islamic weapon in retaliation. So tell me, you want to go to war with Iran, pick your city. Pick your city. Tell me which one you want gone. Seattle? L.A.? Boston? New York? Miami? Pick one, because at least one's going. And that's something we should all think about before we march down this path of insanity that George Bush has us headed on. Well, um, the other point that's even more nerve-wracking is if we might not necessarily commit troops, but certainly I don't think there's, Nasrallah has told, been telling people um, even before the invasion of uh, the Israeli invasion in southern Lebanon this summer, he's been telling people that if we move on Iran, which is of course very much and everybody's, everybody's worried about it, just, just, they're just as worried there as we are here, um, that uh, uh, the, uh, this Sistani, the religious leader of the Shiites in Iraq, will issue a fatwa. There's 11 million roughly Shiites in the country uh, saying you must kill Americans. And so we could see there's 140 or 150,000 troops there. Many of our troops have been detached from units and are now working as trainers and, and, and um, um, uh, aides and, and uh, consultants to Iraqi uh, military and police units. We've got thousands of troops really very much in harm's way. You could see a major bloodbath there. I don't know if that's enough to trigger. Uh, Scott's, uh, what Scott says about the notion of preemption, nuclear preemption, they, they have changed the doctrine. And there's, there's no question about that. I don't know if it's, I still think that's, I, I, I think it's a big bite of the apple. Several, to, uh, several sentimentalists in the audience are curious to know if either of you have picked up the trail of Henry Kissinger in all of this. Well, Woodward certainly did. Uh, in his new book, he writes about Kissinger advising the president. And um, I noticed um, uh, he wrote an interesting review in the New York Times Sunday in which he couldn't help talking about uh, high public officials that have to suffer the dignity of public censure and calumny while in office without being able to respond and to mention that H. Uh, Atchison threatened to punch somebody, which I, people tell me isn't necessarily right, but it's a story. Um, uh, he's been around a lot, and um, like any good courtier, you know, he continues to lie like most people breathe, so he's probably telling Bush pretty much what he wants to hear. A, a number of people who um, have lived much of their lives looking at the world through the uh, prism of the Cold War are struck by the absence tonight of the mention of either Russia or China and are, are curious if, if either of you have um, comments about their role, uh, particularly post-Iraq and in connection with uh, this discussion about Iran. Well, let's, let's never forget that China has one of the world's largest developing economies and they've basically taken uh, their 25-year economic plan and married it, welded it to Iran by basically signing up to $250 billion worth of energy uh, trades over the next 25 years. Um, so China is a big player. They have a vested interest in keeping Iran functioning and uh, keeping Iran viable. Um, the, the Chinese, uh, one of the most telling statements that, uh, that have come out that, the, again, the American press failed to pick up on is when uh, America pulled out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty. 
Um, you know, China at that time had a number of aging uh, liquid-fueled ICBMs that were rotting in silos, and the big question was if they pushed the button, would any of them ever get off the launching pad? Um, and when Wolfowitz and our good friend John Bolton talked about the withdrawal from this, uh, someone talked about, you know, our anti-missile defense shield, and uh, they said, well, it's good against uh, North Korea, rogue nations, and it's, it's good against... Uh, you know, Iraq and things like that. And someone said, well, China might feel threatened by you withdrawing and upgrade their nuclear missile capability. And Bolton said, that's okay, it's a good against the Chinese missiles too. And this is, violates the promise we made to China and Russia that our, our, our missile defense shield wouldn't be targeting their missiles. It wasn't designed to take them on. And the Chinese said, someone said, what are you going to do about it? And the Chinese said, well, there's not much we can do about it now. And you think about that. See, we Americans are so conditioned by TV. You know, we want everything to be solved in 30 minutes because that's what happens on TV. Or, you know, we want our news fed to us in 30-second sound bites, three-minute detailed stories. The Chinese think strategically. The Chinese have a long-term vision of where they're going. And the Chinese, I do believe, are projecting themselves down the road to a period in time when America will be on the descendancy and China will be on the ascendancy and they're thinking that it ain't going to be that far away if George Bush keeps doing what he's doing. Two, um, two, two questions relate to the prospect of resistance on the home front. One, uh, do you see any possibility that U.S. officers or pilots would disobey orders to bomb Iran? And the second, which might require some explanation, if the order comes solely from Bush or Rumsfeld without congressional approval, can the Eisenhower group refuse to respond? Or, the questioner asks, is the Eisenhower another main? <laughs> you talk about the carrier group that's out there. It's not clear what it's doing. Could have been just there for raising the flag. It could have been normal deployment. As Scott said, there's no evidence of any significant bombing gun. It's uh, October surprise. Nobody can rule out anything. But um, I don't think, um, unless there's another Foley around, I think we're basically going to be okay on October surprises. Um, the, um, um, uh, the 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 military will do what the president asks. This is there's just no question about it. There's no chance whatsoever. And um, uh, this gets into an area of stuff I haven't written about, but the military um, made, a, as Scott said, a, 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 as strong a stand as you could make. And there's just no chance that a, a, a president will be defied if he orders combat, no matter what it is. And even if he orders a nuclear strike, if somebody's in trouble. Scott, you agree? A hundred percent. You might get the odd uh, officer who will, who will speak out, but the bottom line is the military is conditioned to obey the lawful orders of the commander-in-chief. And um, while we may not agree with the policy, we may not agree. Congress, thanks to their October 2002 resolution, has created the legal precondition for the lawful use of military force on order by the commander-in-chief to respond to what the commander-in-chief dictates to be threats to the national security of the United States in relation to the global war on terror. So the military officers, while they may disagree with the policy, will faithfully execute the orders they are given. Um, another a missing topic or, or uh, presence in the discussion is, is the United Nations. And one questioner posits that the U.S.-Iraq conflict could be brought to an end if the U.S. declared its readiness to withdraw its troops from Iraq, provided the United Nations declares its readiness to place Iraq under temporary U.N. trusteeship. Is there any any? Well, what, what about the Iraqi people? Has anybody asked them? Because uh, I have a funny feeling they will slaughter the UN more efficiently than they slaughter the American troops. They don't want foreigners in their country. That's why they're resisting us so much. Let's forget the concept of white people fixing brown people's problems. We already broke that country. Okay, it doesn't function. And we are responsible for 80% of the friction that creates the violence that slaughters the Iraqis on a daily basis. You remove America from the equation, you've immediately eliminated 80% of the reasons why people kill each other in Iraq. And we don't need to inject a new 80% solution called the United Nations. The UN has no function on the ground in Iraq 
except to provide humanitarian support if requested by the people of Iraq. Right now, I think the Iraqi people would be best served by the world just getting the hell out of their business and letting them fix their problems. It will be violent, it won't be pretty, but it ain't nearly going to be as violent as what's going on right now. You're saying, you're saying Scott, then, um, um, cutting and running, right? How do, how, let's talk about, let, let's help the Democrats find I call an it answer. saving Marines' lives. I don't call you it know. cutting and running. <laughs> Preserving the integrity of the armed forces. And then the other point therein is simply that you're also saying that as long as we're there, it's doomed. Well, I'm not just saying that. The British general staff has said that. Many Americans have said that. You see uh, a lot of people today acknowledging that we ain't going to win this one. It isn't going to happen. It, we're, we're giving up on democracy. Did you hear that? We're no longer bringing democracy to Iraq. We're throwing democracy out the window, and we're talking about bringing in a five-person junta, a dictatorship. Well, Jesus, didn't we just go to war to get rid of a dictatorship? And now the solution is to bring in a new dictatorship? How stupid can you be? That's a rhetorical question. Um, it was somebody I know, just to show you how acute some of the people, a lot of the people are in the military, somebody I know who works at the JCS sent a private email with the last long email about what would happen if we hit Iran. Just, to, just telling his boss, just giving a report. He ended up by saying, it was a lot of, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we have humor, which is a saving grace sometimes. And he said, what we really ought to do, and this is for a lot of generals he's writing this memo, gutsy guy, he said we ought to say that we're really, really, really sorry we started this, Peren, and we really, 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 really are, and let's bring back Saddam, invite him for a prayer meeting with the president, <laughs> tell Halliburton they can do reconstruction, and let's get the hell out of there, take a mulligan. <laughs> and he just said, let's take a mulligan, let's just say, it's a do-over, we made a mistake. This is advice to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. <laughs> um, do either... If only it were that easy. You know. right. The uh, headlines last week were briefly preoccupied with the extraordinary report in the Lancet of the extrapolation of 650,000 Iraqi civilian casualties in the so-called war in Iraq. Um, a simple denial by Bush and Blair both seems to have put an end to the matter. Um, do you uh, have a sense of the reliability of this assessment and can you uh, suggest why it has disappeared so quickly from the debate? I can answer the first part, which is that I asked somebody who's quite an expert in public health and statistical evaluations. This is done partly by Johns Hopkins, which is, uh, as anybody who knows, is one of the better, more, uh, more interesting, brighter places in medical schools. And they certainly knew, anticipated the, uh, the uproar. Um, they had 80% um, of, uh, you know, they were doing extrapolation from a series of interviews, and 80% of the deaths they were extrapolating from were, uh, they had death certificates for. In other words, they, they surveyed whatever the group was. They extrapolated, let's say, from 2,000 different families, and the number of deaths they had, 80% of those that they've been told about were backed up with actual physical um, uh, death, death certificates. You know, there is still a functioning um, um, uh, coronary and morgue, morgue system there. So they anticipated it. I don't think they anticipated how easy it would be, although God knows it is that easy, uh, for, the, for this story to be driven aside. And uh, Scott, you and I talk about the press all the time. Well, look, here, here's the bottom line. Why are we surprised? I mean, what they say, 650,000 Iraqis? Jesus, America didn't blink when we uh, killed 1.2 to 2.2 million during the decade of economic sanctions. We don't care about Iraqis. We never cared about Iraqis. These are brown people who aren't like us. They only are about a third of American life. You know, that's the bottom line. We, 
we have conditioned ourselves into believing that the Iraqis don't value human life as much as we, the people of the United States, do. Therefore, when we throw a large number out there, it's just statistics. These aren't human beings suffering. Iraqi women don't cry when their children die. Iraqi men don't cry when their wife dies. These are human beings. These are terrorists. These are bad people. These are Muslims. They don't practice the same life values we do. Come on, don't you get it? So when we say 650,000, it doesn't register. It doesn't resonate. And then when the president comes out with a throwaway line that deflates the estimates, we go, oh, whew, thank God that was wrong. Okay, let's move on. The bottom line is we don't care about the people of Iraq, and I challenge any American out there to show me otherwise. Because we keep killing them every day. Take, m moving from the uh, assessment of fact to the uh, assessment of prospect, if a U.S. bombing raid were to strike an Iranian nuclear facility, you have already pointed out that this would trigger an exchange, and you've already suggested in your mind that we're going forward willy-nilly. But if you could separate from those two observations, could you comment on what the prospective environmental consequences would be of uh, such, a, uh, such, a, such a strike? The Iranian nuclear program is in such infancy that there's not going to be any environmental impact. I mean, what are we going to scatter around? Concrete? Some steel? Um, you know, they, they, when they enrich uranium, they're enriching right now, it, it's in, proto, it, it's in you know, laboratory scale, bench scale uh, amounts. This isn't a massive effort that's producing massive amounts of enriched material. This is research and development. Uh, and so, no, there's not going to be environmental impact derived from that. Uh, that's the lunacy of this all. We're talking about war over nothing. There's nothing there to bomb. There's some concrete. There's some steel. There's a couple centrifuges. There's some spare parts. There's people. Imagine that. When do we stop bombing? When we kill all the people who know how to do this? Do we target every blueprint? Do we target every computer? What are we targeting? Because there is no program to target. Nothing. We'll drop bombs on a few facilities. We'll collapse the buildings. We'll scatter the material. Most of that material will have been moved to another location anyways. And there won't be an environmental impact. And, and, and again, that some people say, that's, that's good news. No, ladies and gentlemen, that's the bad news, because it means there's no reason for us to talk about going to war in the first place. Yeah, but Scott, Curtis LeMay in February of 45, I think that's when, complained bitterly. He'd been doing city bombing in Japan, remember the fire bombing in Tokyo, etc. And he complained in February of 45 that he'd been bombing and bombing, there was nothing left to bomb, and they still fought. <laughs> and the other point is that once we do the bombing, we're going to be into it that we're going to have a country that's going to be absolutely um, uh, rigorously, uh, not only wanting revenge, but rigorously fighting us all and fighting us in a lot of places, including back home. And that'll, be the, that'll be the environmental impact, the oil spilling out into the Gulf, the oil spilling out into the ground, uh, and the pollution brought on by the bombing. But I thought the question was about nuclear fallout. There's nothing nuclear to fall out in Iran. Um, <laughs> I sense that we could go down through these very provocative questions for a long time, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, we'll reconvene down the road, uh, conceivably at a happier juncture. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our two marvelous uh, participants this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Former U.N. weapons inspector Scott Ritter and Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter Seymour Hirsch, hosted by the New York Society for Ethical Culture. For more information on the Society, visit their website at nysec.org. See this program again tonight at 11.30 Eastern here on Book TV.